Hi, I'm Avery Davidson. Thank you for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, the only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. My partner, Kristen Oaks White, is at home with her baby boy, Teddy. Water is always an important component of agriculture, and we begin this week with our focus on the Mississippi River. If you live in Louisiana, the river affects you directly, either economically or culturally. Right now, the Mississippi River at Baton Rouge is just above five feet deep. That's the lowest it's been in about 10 years, and that's hurting Louisiana's economy, especially in farm country where farmers are bringing their harvest to the nearest elevator. The low river levels are causing barges to be loaded more lightly so they don't bottom out. This means delays and unexpected costs at a time of supply chain issues and tightening grain supplies worldwide. The low levels are caused by a lack of rainfall in the Midwest, which is affecting crops there. Closer to home, our own drought does not affect the river much, but is affecting farmers' income after a year of higher fuel and fertilizer prices. In the foreseeable future, that means higher prices for food for you at home. Joining us now is Greg Fox, a grain marketing specialist with the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association. And Greg, what do these low river levels mean for our ports here in Louisiana? Well, like you mentioned, you can't put as much on those barges that are coming down river now. So it's, they're still getting the same amount of barges that they would typically get this time of year, just fewer bushels. So that hurts them in blending some of the damage that we've seen earlier in this year and a little bit of the damage is still coming out of the field. Uh, so it's putting a strain on what they can dump on trucks. They've limited to some of the damage they can handle. So instead of getting those full good barges, they're only getting about half. And so it hurts our farmers getting that grain out of the field right now. So obviously we were talking a little bit about too little rain in the Midwest. During August, we had way too much rain while our farmers were trying to harvest their early beans. What kind of damage have we seen and what does that mean for the future of them getting their, those crops out? Well, in August and first part of September, we saw a lot of high damage, 20, 30 percent damage, 15 percent damage. As we got into some of the later beans, we saw a lot of that clean up. We are seeing good grain come out of the field. We're seeing some 1 percent, 2 percent grain. It's just that these elevators took on a lot of damage early. A lot of high damage barges were sitting on the river. So they still got to get some of those barges off the river. So if they purchased any of those barges or if they owned any of them, they lo loaded a barge for storage, they got to start getting that stuff off. So they're still limited to some of what they can take in right now. But fortunately, we're seeing good grain come out of the fields. And so as they get through this mess with the low rivers, then hopefully we can get back to somewhat business as usual. And when we talk about damage to crops, we're talking about discounted grain when they go to sell it, correct? Correct. So, I mean, you're looking at 50, 60, $2 bushel discounts on some of the stuff coming out of the field. And does that make it tougher for farmers to keep their yeah, bottom it, line? It, it cuts into their profits. So it's, you know, instead of getting full price for that crop, you're losing two, three, four dollars off the top. Now, it's been reported that the Gulf region has one of the highest premiums in the world for our products. And that might get more expensive because of something going on with the rail lines. What can you tell me about yeah, that? There's a strike going on with the rail line. They didn't come to an agreement with all the unions. So that's still a concern. So we continue to see pretty good basis levels with the elevators are offering for the farmers to go to those facilities. We're still seeing some good levels right now because they want to continue to get that good grain with the limited amount of bushels on a barge. They want to continue to get those truck grain coming in. So we're seeing good prices for the farmers right now, even though we're still seeing some of the obstacles with damage and higher discounts there. Yeah, and those prices are what fuel our rural economies. Thank you very much, Greg Fox with the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Welcome. Association. Well, as you've seen, Louisiana farmers have been plagued by the extremes this year when it comes to weather. Earlier this summer, many farmers and ranchers were in a serious drought in dire need of rain. For many, those prayers were answered with more than 20 inches of rain at the worst possible time, harvest. In July, Twilas Carl Wiggers visited James Davis on his cotton farm that was one of those needing a rain. Davis now has an update on how his crop has progressed. Uh, this cotton field we stand standing in now, it didn't look like a cotton field. It looked like somebody had just basically recently planted it and was hoping to, to get a solid stand. Well, after the visit and a bunch of prayers, uh, God sent rain. And the amount of rain he sent was excessive in some instances, and in some instances you can look and see that it was just what the doctor ordered. Some of the cotton 
that received the excessive rain was too far along and it didn't help it. It just made it uh, regrow a lot and put a, a bunch of what I call switches on top of the cotton. It didn't do it very well, but this cotton was young enough and was not far along enough that the water was just what the doctor needed. So it got all of this rain in August and then it stopped and cotton loved that. And it was hot and basically moist and it just did what cotton do, put on fruit and set bowls. And you know, it wasn't no rain to knock the fruit off of it. And you can tell by just looking at it, it got more or less what it need. And um, man, it's nothing but a blessing. With the amount of rainfall that we got, um, I would say probably about 60% of my cotton, it took it over the top. And the other 40%, it kind of just made it just start back growing again because at the time of the rain, there was about 40% of my cotton crop that uh, my agronomist was basically telling us, we may be picking cotton before August because the cotton was basically had been cut out and was opening and then it started raining. I don't think the grade's gonna be as great on that first pick cotton as this later pick cotton. This is what I grew up doing. I was raised on a cotton farm. My father grew cotton every year since 77. To be back in cotton, and you know, some of these rows that we standing in has had cotton on them since the 70s and 80s, you know. You know, it's kind of like a dream, you know, when you go back to doing what you know to do. I'm very excited about picking this cotton, but you know, I do have some that is not, don't look nearly this good. While Davis still has plenty of crop left to harvest, he says he's optimistic about the cotton crop he has in his fields. Sugarcane harvest is in full swing across Louisiana. Like many other farmers in the state, sugarcane farmers were also hit hard by heavy rains in the month of August. That delayed the planting of a new crop. As harvest ramped up, Twyla's Carl Wiggers traveled to St. Martin Parish to show us all the moving pieces it takes to sweeten our lives. Across South Louisiana, sugarcane farmers are working hard to finish planting next year's cane crop. Like many others, Mike Melanson should also be harvesting the last of his soybeans, but not this year. So right now we're running one, one cane harvester, our whole planting crew, and we also have, normally we'd be cutting a the last of our soybeans with a combine. Today, we're, we're doing it with a 15 foot bush haul because damage is so severe. There's no reason to harvest it. So, uh, so we're having to clean up our fields. So we have a lot going on. Many farmers across South Louisiana will plant soybeans on their land that will later be planted in new sugarcane around August and September. Melanson says the cost to grow soybeans this year means the loss will really hurt their bottom line. Normally where soybeans might have been an afterthought as far as a crop, it's getting to be really expensive. It can be profitable if you can, if you can harvest them. And most of the time we can just five, six, seven weeks of, and not say excessive rain, but just excessive moisture. You know, we didn't have, we didn't have flooding rains. We just had constant, just poor weather. And, you know, in a year like this, there's just so many things going on at the same time and being behind on all things. And then on top of that, the soybean crop really just falling off. We're gonna get about 25% of our gross revenue in, in a year when potentially we had one of our best revenue crops yet on soybeans. Just, it's kind of disheartening. It's hard to look at a bush hog going up and down your fields. But when you look, when you follow the bush hog and you don't see any beans at all, uh, you realize there was nothing there anyway. So it, it, it's amazing how bad it got and how quick it got. But that's kind of what we're used to in the, in the farming world. While the bush hog was not part of the plans, Melanson has shifted his attention to his cane crop. While his mature soybeans hated the rain, it was exactly what the sugar cane needed. The wet period, helped our growth out a lot. It, you know, we had some sun mixed in with the rain, so exactly what a tropical crop needs. We were really dry in June, however, and the crop, had, especially from I-10 north, it suffered somewhat. So this, uh, this, that rainy spell kind of got it back on track. So uh, as much of a detriment it was to our soybean crop, uh, it probably saved our cane crop. So it's, Kind of bittersweet. Bittersweet indeed, but Melanson is hopeful and optimistic for this year's cane crop, which still has a long harvest ahead. The sugar content looks good. If we can have a good dry season, at least a dry October, uh, let, let the cane continue to mature, um, there's, there's potentially brighter days ahead on, on sugar. 
Of course, it's still early. Weather could change. We could have a storm. Uh, so we're uh, we never count our chickens for, for sure. So. In Cecilia, I'm Carl Wiggers for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture. Right now, all the mills in Louisiana are running. If you're on the roads in South Louisiana, be sure to be on the lookout for cane harvesters, trucks, tractors over the next few months. Take it a little slower. Harvest will continue through the new year. We wish all of our farmers a safe and bountiful sugarcane harvest season. And to that end, being safe around railroads is particularly important. While we've managed to avoid truck and train collisions on sugarcane farms so far this year, it remains a constant danger. Twyla's Neil Malanson takes us to account where railroads and farmers are working together to keep our farm workers safe. Sugarcane harvest is well underway here in LeCount in central Louisiana. It's the busiest time of year, not just for the fields, but the roadways. Sometimes between the trucks and cane equipment, these crossings can be used more than 100 times a day. We can have you know, up to 30 to 40 trucks a day cross the railroad tracks, and then each of those trucks takes three to three and a half carts per truck to fill. You know, so you can get 120, 180, uh, cart loads crossing the railroad tracks a day plus the trucks. As busy and as difficult as harvest season can get, it can always get worse. In fact, a train like this struck a tractor trailer near Bubenzer's field last year. It was, uh, it was early morning, so it was dark, and we had a, a truck from one of our mills cross the railroad track to pull onto Highway 71. Uh, did not see the approaching train and the train struck about the last two feet of the trailer of, of the, uh, with, that we had just loaded with cane. And uh, of course, the train stopped. Uh, it took several hours to clear it. Fortunately, nobody was injured, uh, but just a, a big mess and, and a, quite, a, quite a bit of loss of property and, and, uh, and time. A partnership between Union Pacific and the sugarcane industry is helping stop these accidents. It all starts with these little blue signs. Now at each crossing we also do have a blue card on the crossing post and there's an ENS number, emergency notification system number that allows you to call if you're going to be operating within that crossing. And each crossing also has a specific number that when you call that number you give the crossing uh, identification number and a re emergency response is able to GPS that particular crossing no matter where it's at. Corbera says the signs are not just for accidents. You can call ahead of time when you're working near a private crossing and some trains will even slow down in that area. If there's going to be a lot of activity and we know ahead of time, say a day or two ahead of time, at least 24 hours, you call the number on the blue card to let the railroad emergency response know that they'll be operating within the area. The railroad will create a Form C, a bulletin, and notification to train crews that there's going to be heavy activity in that area. It allows the train crew to know to make noise, sound bells and whistle, and be, uh, be looking out for traffic in that area. At every railroad crossing in Louisiana, both public and private, there are these blue signs with a 1-800 number on them that can be called 24 hours a day and this individual number that lets them know where this individual crossing is. Now, as I said, you can call that number at any time. If you're a sugarcane operator and have heavy activity in the area, a lot of crossings across the track, you can let them know and they will be sure to blow the whistle and perhaps even slow down for the area. Or if you're a private citizen that has an emergency on the track, at any given location, you can call them and they will stop the train to prevent the accident from being worse. These little blue signs can make the difference between life and death. Reporting for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, I'm Neil Malanson. Sugarcane harvest will likely last through mid-January, which is why it's so important to stay vigilant. Farming a tropical crop like sugarcane in Louisiana comes with many challenges. One of them is dealing with nutrient and sediment runoff into many of the bayous crisscrossing the state. LSU Ag Center reporter Craig Gotro looks at an effort underway to lessen the environmental impact of farming. Louisiana's sugarcane belt is expanding, and LSU Ag Center researchers are examining ways to reduce the environmental footprint of farming through a $1.4 million grant from the Patrick F. Taylor Foundation. We're also monitoring water quality that's coming out of these fields, whether it's in best management practices or sort of farmer standard practices, so we can show the benefits from that as well of reducing nutrients flowing out of the field, reducing sediment that's coming out of the field. 
Nitrogen fertilizer is essential to producing a good crop, but it's expensive and pollutes water when it leaves the farm. This project has shown Keith Duga ways to reduce both his nitrogen applications and cost. Through the project, we learn where uh, it really doesn't need all that nitrogen. <clears throat> and expensive like everything is these days, you need to try to cut back wherever you can where it won't hurt your yield. After harvest, cane farmers burn the residue left in the field to help stimulate growth for next year. Duga has been sweeping the residue between the rows as an alternative to burning. With burning, we have seen very short-term um, in increases in things like nitrogen into the soil, but they don't last for very long, so they don't really support um, sustainable growth from that. Um, so part of the goal of the sweeping is to reduce the need for burning to remove that residue. Fultz said as the residue breaks down, it provides nutrients to the soil. Taylor Foundation representatives are pleased with research and its potential for improving agriculture and the environment. It is one of the most excited programs we have ever funded and we plan to continue funding it because we have a deep interest in agriculture and the future of the state of Louisiana. Researchers are hoping the findings generated from the study will become standard practices throughout the sugarcane industry. With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gotro reporting. A similar project is underway on a corn, cotton, and soybean farm in North Louisiana. Still to come on Twyla, it's the greatest of all time. I'm kidding, it's a goat story. Stay with us. What started as helping family members dealing with soap allergies turned into baking and now letting children learn all about farm life. This week, Twyla's Brianne Hendrickson visits Briar Hill Farm in Ruston, Louisiana, a place that will really get your goat. When you think of goat's milk or fudge, you don't think of them going together. But for Lori Faber, she did. The time we started making the goat milk fudge, um, goat milk was not really used or known of that much here in the U.S. Um, and just the difference the goat milk makes in the fudge, people really noticed the difference. And uh, so we had, we were already selling soap at Farmer's Market way before we started selling um, fudge or anything. And so uh, we started just with a few flavors and it went well, so we decided to branch out. <laughs> With capitalizing on the dairy goats, she also used her 20 plus years of knowledge in this industry to help widen her farm. With fresh produce to chickens and bees and eggs. We're both from farming families and um, we raised our kids on fresh vegetables and they worked on the farm. And so it's just, it's just life. It's just regular what we're used to. With growing up in this way of life, she understands the importance of learning about it. So she has opened her gates to let learning in. We have done school field trips for years and the kids always love it. And just to see everything start from a seed and go to the finish and work with the animals and uh, they're good to talk to. They don't tell anybody anything. And we did two sessions. Um, and we have waiting lists for both sessions. We had everywhere from children who live on a farm to one child who had been on a farm one afternoon and that was it. And then at the end of the week, uh, after they had worked the farm all week, they got to take home their share. They took home all the vegetables they worked with and the honey and all the stuff they made and um, a lot of kids tasted things they had never tasted before and realized they liked apples and cucumbers and all kinds of stuff. So it went, it went really well. If you would like to plan a field trip to Briar Hill Farm or just pay the goats a visit, you'll find a link to learn more on our website, twilighttv.org. You can also find out how to try some of their goodies there as well. Southern University held its Small Farmers Conference at the Baton Rouge Hilton recently. The event brought together farmers from around the state to hear from guest speakers on the state of the farm economy, tours, and workshops on innovative small farm practices. Dr. Brian Phillips, small farmer specialist with the Southern University Ag Center, says this is the first year the event moved off campus 
and the plan is for the conference to be held in different locations each year. It's a Louisiana Small Farmers Conference. It's not a Southern University. We want to bring everybody to Baton Rouge all the time. We want, we want to go meet the farmer where they are. We want to meet them at, uh, in Alexandria. We want to meet them in Lake Charles. We want to meet them in Shreveport, Monroe, those other parts of the state. I want to bring that, the conference to them so that we can showcase their farms, their operations, make, make it accessible for them. Lieutenant Governor Billy Nungesser was on hand for the event and says small farmers are not only key to local economies, but helping the state grow, especially in agritourism. We're also seeing more and more uh, it's a tourist attraction. People want to get off the beaten path. They want to see something new, get their hands dirty. Uh, so working with Commissioner Mike Strain, talking to some of the farmers here today to see what we can do more to promote those small farms and, and bringing tourists there to learn how the crops are growing, the cattle are raised, and all the great things that happen that make Louisiana special. We have a link for more about the conference on our website at twilatv.org. Still to come on Twyla, connecting farmers and consumers is what we do here. How about farms and classrooms? We'll tell you how to connect those two places next. It's October, which means Halloween. I'm already wearing my mask. No, it means Ag in the Classroom teacher workshops are happening right now. These workshops help teachers incorporate agriculture into their curriculum and offers resources, ideas, lesson plans, activities, and more, all for free. Certificates for continued learning units are provided. On Wednesday, October 19th, the workshop will be held at the St. Martin Parish Extension Office on Courthouse Street in Brobridge. And on Thursday, October 20th, Acadia Parish Farm Bureau will hold its annual workshop in Crowley. And then finally, on October 25th, the last workshop will be held at the St. Charles Parish East Regional Library on West Campus Drive in Destrehan. All workshops will begin at 4 p.m. They're each free, but you must register online. We'll provide a link for you to register on our website at twilatv.org. Now for this week's Twila Boost, we're excited to promote a trip that we're really looking forward to taking. For the first time ever, the American Farm Bureau Convention is heading to Puerto Rico. The theme this year is Mi Familia, and it's going to be a convention to remember for the Farm Bureau family. It'll be January 6th through 11th, 2023, of course, in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Many are probably wondering how the island fared after Hurricane Fiona, and convention facilities are fully operational and ready to host the entire Farm Bureau family. At the convention, attendees will have the opportunity to participate in a variety variety of workshops on issues like the 2023 Farm Bill, policy updates, market outlooks, trade, and handling farm stress. This convention will also be a great opportunity for farmers and ranchers to see and learn about all the crops Puerto Rico grows and the practices they use. Now, personally, I'm excited to do a story on the research farms there that work with the LSU Ag Center. And I know Twyla's Carl Wiggers, well, he's going to go and hit every darn coffee farm he can go and find out where his Starbucks comes from. Now you can leave your passports at home, but come ready to explore all the host city has to offer. We'll be close enough to explore beautiful old San Juan, enjoy the beaches, and enjoy all the convention programs that the American Farm Bureau staff are preparing for us. The 2023 convention will be a great getaway to enjoy some sunshine, some good food fellowship, and learn together how we can continue to strengthen our ag and our communities. Registration is open now, and we want you to join us. You can find a link on our website to register at twilatv.org. Well, that does it for this edition of Twila. Be sure to join us next week. We'll have a really hot story for you. Until then, you can watch all our stories online at twilatv.org, and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. You can also find all of these stories and more on our YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe, turn on notifications, so you know when we put something else out, and also follow us on TikTok. For all of us here at Twyla, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again right here next week.